Welcome, and thank you for joining the New America Fellows Program and the International Security Program for this webinar discussion of Hassan Abbas's The Prophet's Heir. I'm Awisto Youb, Director of the Fellows Program. For more than 20 years, New America has supported hundreds of fellows who've gone on to publish books, produce documentary films, and other deeply reported projects. We're grateful to be able to host Hassan for this conversation today. And Hassan, congratulations on the publication of your book. Before we start, a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions during the event, please submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and Kim will answer them or, or actually present them to Hassan to answer accordingly. Um, if you need closed captioning, Zoom now provides that function. Please click the CC button at the bottom of the menu bar. We encourage you to sign up to our newsletter and events list so that you can learn more about the Fellows Program and receive future invitations like these. And you can find that information on our website. And more importantly, copies of The Profits Air are available for purchase through our book selling partner, Solid State Books. And you can find that link to buy that book um, on the event card, uh, which you'll see momentarily. Before I turn the conversation over to Kim and Hassan, let me introduce you to them. Hassan Abbas was a class of 2017 National Fellow with us. He's the Distinguished Professor of International Relations at the Near East, South Asia, and Strategic Studies Center with the National Defense University in Washington, DC. He also serves as a senior advisor with a pro project on Shiism and global affairs at Harvard University's Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. His current research work focuses on building narratives for countering political and religious extremism and rule of law reforms in developing states. Earlier, he served as professor and department chair at National Defense University's College of International Security Affairs and as the distinguished Kad Iazam professor at Columbia University. Kim Gaddis is a journalist, author, and analyst with more than 20 years of experience in print and broadcast media covering the Middle East, international affairs, and US foreign policy. She was reporter for the BBC and the Financial Times and De Volkskrant. She is a non-resident senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She is the author of Black Wave, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the 40 year rivalry that unraveled culture, religion, and collective memory in the Middle East, which was named a New York Times Notable Book of 2020. She's also the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Secretary, a journey with Hillary Clinton from Beirut to the heart of American power. She serves on the board of trustees of the American University of Beirut and on the board of directors of the Organization of Arab Reporters for the Investigative Journalism. She was born and raised in Beirut. Uh, with that, Kim, I'll turn the conversation over to you. You're on mute, Kim. Uh, thank you very much, Awisto. We're still, even though we've been doing this for over a year, we still have these little um, moments uh, of, uh, please unmute your, your microphone. Uh, you'd think that by now we, we would get used to it. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for uh, asking me to uh, be in conversation with Hassan Abbas about his uh, new book. Hassan, it's great to see you from a distance. It's great to be in conversation with you about this really important book, The Prophet's Heir. Um, this is the life and legacy of one of Prophet Muhammad's closest confidants and Islam's patron saint, Ali ibn Abi Talib who is you know, one of the most important spiritual and intellectual authorities in Islam after um, the prophet. And if I'm not mistaken, um, this is one of the first such biographies to come out um, in English. And I think not only is it a very important work that you poured a lot of effort in, it's a great contribution to the conversation, not only about um, Imam Ali, but also about Islam in general, about Sunnism and Shiism. And I must say uh, that I found it incredibly well written, uh, very accessible to a generalist audience. Really, the prose was beautiful. Um, the complex matter is explained very in a very accessible manner, and I really um, enjoyed reading it, and I learned a lot, and I'm delighted to be in conversation with you uh, today. Um, I want to start with asking you a quick answer, for a quick answer for those in the audience who don't know who Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, is. Um, give us a 30 second uh, explanation of who he is so that we can then delve into the conversation. Thank you so much. First, um, I'm truly honored. Um, thank you so much to New America for the support. Thank you very much, Kim, 
um, for, for doing this. Um, 30 seconds. Uh, so Ali ibn Abi Talib is the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him's right hand man, his chief aide, um, his closest associate, uh, also his cousin, um, and then later on his son-in-law. Um, for, uh, for the Shia Muslims, he was also the, the first Imam and the Shiism believes that the prophethood ended and the concept of Imamat, which is um, kind of a spiritual status given to the close associates that started. And for the Sunni Muslims, he was also extremely important, uh, but, but uh, also as the fourth caliph. So she has also believed him as the fourth caliph, but the last line, she has also believed that he, his right was taken away. He should have been the prophet's successor right after his death. That, that would be a 30 second. And again, not to simplify things uh, too much, but I think it's important for our audience to um, get a quick introduction to these to these concepts. You just mentioned um, Shias uh, feel that um, Ali's right to be the, 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 the heir of, of the, the prophet was taken away from him. He was the fourth caliph, but he was not the first. He was not his heir. Sunnis uh, see him as the fourth caliph, but they don't necessarily see him as the prophet's heir. And that brings us straight into the idea of the Sunni Shia divide. I know that's a very long conversation and that's not necessarily the topic of our conversation today, but give us a 30 second explanation of where that difference lies. Uh, the theological difference, um, if you will. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's far more complex uh, than a simple uh, label as Shia or Sunni. Uh, there are so many groups within the Shia, but there are so many groups within the Sunni. And, um, and, there's a, and as I'll talk later on, there's a great uh, commonality as well. But also, I would say uh, the Sufis who actually combine uh, the, the worldview about, about Ali. So it is about Ali as the, the Sufi saint or the patron saint also, the, who every major Sunni group in the world today, um, except one believes Ali to be their supreme master. And, and, and the differences, the theological differences uh, became apparent over a period of time. For the first, I would say even 100 years, there were no distinct or 200 years, no distinct group of Shia Sunni. They developed later on, it became very political, now there are theological differences in the way they would pray, but minor differences. So some would call it political, some would call it theological, some would call it even spiritual. Um, so there, there are so many different ways I can explain it. Uh, but the, the crux is uh, the word Shia means those who are the friends of Ali. The partisans of Ali, Shia of Ali. Shia of Ali, that would be one way. Shias emphasize Ali's centrality to Islam more than the Sunnis. That, that's in, in, in very short, I can... Uh, and we'll get into um, some of that divide at the heart of, of Islam uh, in the conversation, uh, because you address some of it in, in your book, mostly um, a little bit in the introduction, but also uh, in the conclusion. I don't wanna give away too much already at the beginning, but we'll talk about how the figure of, um, of Ali ibn Abi Talib can help bridge that divide, which I think is a wonderful, um, element that you have in, in your book. A lot of people today, because of the headlines, because of sectarian violence that we've witnessed over the last couple of decades in the Arab and Muslim world, um, believe that uh, Sunnis and Shias have always killed each other, uh, that it's always been beset by violence. But it's not really the case, as I write myself in, in my book, it's really because of the headlines that we see today the, the, the schism is there, it's an historical one, uh, but you yourself, Hassan, are proof that coexistence uh, between Sunnis and, and Shias is very much possible, is very much part of people's everyday life still in many cases. Um, tell us a little bit about your experience in the world of Islam, in the world of Sunnis and Shiism, and why that drove you to write this book. Thank you so much. Um, that also allows me to provide a personal context. Um, so um, I was, when I was growing up in Pakistan, um, this is 1980s and going from school to later on college, that's the time when a military dictator by the name of General Ziaul Haq was at the helm of affairs. And that's the time when in, in Pakistan at that time, this whole issue of whether you are Shia or Sunni became uh, kind of more important. 
and in my personal tradition, uh, my parents belong to two different traditions, one Shia, one Sunni. My grandparents also was one Shia and one Sunni. And this question was kind of uh, very uh, unusual for me if anyone would ask me in Pakistan at that time in the 1980s, whether you were a Shia or a Sunni, because it, it would not matter to a great extent, although the identities were very uh, clear. Then points my, my move to United States in 2001 and, and the whole 9-11 tragedy, um, then of course the whole your religious identity assumed a different level. Um, and then I saw in America also for the first time, 2003, four after the Iraq war, people started asking you, you are a Shia or a Sunni? And then my role as a teacher and professor and people would ask. Were they asking you that, were they asking you that in the US? Yes. Um, uh, were they asking you that in the US? Yeah. That started happening in the West after, I think, 9 11 and after 2003, the Iraq war, because everyone was saying, okay, what is a Shia and a Sunni? So, for my, my own uh, experience and life, a personal experience has been one of, as you've rightly said, of not only coexistence, uh, but, but we were never told at home to, to, to have a certain bias. But I had seen people becoming very uh, conscious of this division. One short anecdote, I, I remember this was a few years ago, five or six years ago, I was at the Istanbul airport and I was going for uh, Umrah or Hajj um, uh, to Saudi Arabia wearing my uh, clothes uh, which we wear for uh, going for pilgrimage, which is white sheets, two white sheets. A person walks up to me and shows me a picture and says, do you know this person? I could see, I think I, I realized who it was and I was in a different mode. I'm going for a pilgrimage. And I said, no. He said, this is Hassan Nasrallah. Do you recognize him? This is Istanbul International Airport. And I said, yes, um, I think, uh, I, but I don't know him. He immediately asked me, you are Shia or Sunni? And again, being in a spiritual mode and that in any case, I didn't want to answer. I said, I'm a simple Muslim. And he's, then he started a whole speech about Nasrallah, what he was doing was he was clearly wearing my police hat and law enforcement or uh, as a security analyst, he was recruiting. I had made a couple of calls to my yeah. students, intelligence and police in uh, Turkey. I don't know what happened later on, uh, but, but that's the way it has gone so deep. People immediately ask you of, of your identity. So people are forced to then assume those, those, uh, that, that sectarian identity as well. And so why did you want to write this, this book, uh, Hassan? What did you feel was necessary to add in the conversation? What was missing and what drove you personally to, uh, to, draw, to, um, uh, to, uh, to write this book? First and foremost, I think it was a personal um, search for a hero. Um, and when I say that a personal search for a hero, um, I mean, in ordinary life, we constantly look back, all of us, to, to look for heroes of the past so that we can navigate the present. And um, when I had, I remember still when I first read about at least this famous quote, um, if you're not my brother in faith, you are my equal in humanity. Um, I, I, I was always somebody who admired uh, uh, Ali. My, my admiration became more intense when I learned more about him. And I found him to be a person of all times and for all people. And what the, I mean by that is, um, there are very few historical figures um, who can overcome their, their image as, I mean, most of these are seen as either religious leaders, political leaders, warriors, um, a great sports person, et cetera, et cetera. Ali was one who had seen fame, who had seen popularity, who was the bravest warrior, a chivalrous man, need, seen as, as the patron saint as well. And he combined all those very important characteristics in a very elegant fashion. And he went through a very tragic uh, path as well. He, as in his own view, his right was taken away, but he never took up arms, never started a political campaign to, to fight his other contemporaries. So that was one reason I saw in him a personality who's very relevant today. In today's age, which is very polarized, which is where divisiveness, look at the world today in terms of uh, politicization, polarization. So his, his personality um, in that sense really inspired me. One quote that also got my attention early on was Edward Gibbon, who had said, uh, early united the qualifications uh, of a poet, a soldier, and a saint. And I think that's what, what explains it, it the best. 
Uh, and last but not the least, other than the Shia Sunni factor, which is because constantly when you see divisiveness within your own religious tradition that you're very proud of, you're a practicing Muslim, and you see all those beauties and th the depth or essence of your religion kind of buried um, just under these sectarian labels, it's become, it becomes a very painful experience for you as well. And last but not the least, the, the why uh, the response to the why, I think in the United States in the post 9-11 scenario, there are certain sweeping generalizations and we, which uh, many security analysts and uh, myself part of it, that world of security um, specialists and scholars um, who look at a religious tradition purely from a security lens. And that takes away the spirituality part, uh, the mysticism part, um, everything else, the humanitarian part. And I thought by telling this story, I can bring a discussion about Islam uh, in a way that that is missing from the main discourse in the moment. So who was your audience, um, Hassan, when you wrote this book? Was it the security establishment in, in the US to give them a different narrative? Was it um, the general audience? Was it Muslims themselves, both in the US and uh, in other countries in, in the Muslim world? All of them in a sense, but most primarily, uh, one, I was really surprised um, that there was no biography of Ali. Um, published by any Western academic press, even other presses. Well, there are two or three books. Most of these are translations. I mean, Ali's biographies are so many in Persian, Arabic, Turkish, Urdu. Um, I, I have around me about, I think, 70 or 80 of his biographies in different languages. Um, all terrific, but then all written from a Sunni perspective or a Shia perspective or a Sufi perspective. And in the West, luckily, um, to give credit where due, most publishing houses published biographies of Prophet Muhammad, these people, in, in many years. But that's where then the conversation stopped. Uh, and for an ordinary American and an ordinary person of faith, uh, irrespective of the tradition, um, other than the Prophet of Islam, which is extremely important, uh, and Ali reflected whatever he learned from the Prophet, but there's no more narrative on the intricacies um, of Islam. Even for instance, um, I'll mention uh, Rumi. Rumi, you, you go to any bookstore, you'll find Rumi. So few know that for uh, the spiritual mentor of, of uh, Rumi was Ali. Rumi in all his poetry says again and again that my inspiration and my love and my leader is Ali. So, so those, I thought I have an audience um, I can reach out to it. Last but not the least, young Muslims, whether in America or elsewhere. I see a lot of hope in this new generation because they see the contradictions, they see the divisions, they see the authoritarianism, they see um, the kind of that their ad ad adults or Muslims are by and large boxed into different uh, uh, groups and they have a tendency. And I've learned this from my own daughters, three daughters. Uh, I'm very uh, proud and very lucky uh, to have three daughters, 20, 22, uh, and 24. Uh, and, and they, the questions they would ask um, always uh, wanted me to think about. If you allow me, just one anecdote is out of the blue coming to my mind. When we moved to Washington, D.C. from New York about 10 years ago, uh, we were living then in McLean. And uh, so my daughter was the youngest one who was born in America, who would often ask. Uh, she would see always, we are trying to figure out where is the closest mosque. And the closest mosque at that time was like 40, or where we wanted to go was 40 or 50 minute drive. But on our street were like three different churches. She would ask uh, Baba or Father, what is the, why people go to church? She was like at that time, three or four years, uh, five years old. And we would say, no, people pray to God. And she then one day said that if, why we go to a mosque? She said, to pray, to approach God. And she said, so why we drive for one hour to go to see God? The God is right next to you are saying the church also has a God. And I realized, oh, how do I answer? Next week, we, we set a Sunday, we went to the church. Uh, so so th this is my, my hope that I'll be able to reach out to the, my Western audience, but also especially young Muslims. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and this is a, you know, a really wonderful uh, uh, anecdote. And, and I think you raise your daughters uh, very well um, to have this sort of uh, uh, open, openness to, um, to others and, to, and this curiosity uh, of others uh, uh, as well. Uh, and I know that they played a great role in, in helping you shape the prose 
uh, of this book, and I think uh, she did a she did a great job. Um, I, I want to ask you about the title of the book, "The Prophet's Heir." It's quite the statement, um, actually, because this is at the heart of, in essence, the dispute between Sunnis and Shias. Who is the Prophet's heir? And if you're, you know, ultra Orthodox uh, Wahhabi, you could look at this title and say, "Well, that's quite, uh, you know, um, the position you're taking." And we, um, you know, we 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 don't agree with with that title. What what is your response to that? Very important question, and indeed, um, some Sunni friends as well as Shia friends had issues. With some of the Shia thought this will uh, box my narrative, and let me say it a bit maybe provocatively. I think actually this is the most unifying title that I could think of, and actually I give at least uh, some credit to my editor uh, Heather McCallum for this. The reason I say this is that I am taking a different position in the book. I'm arguing. That Ali, um, the, the dis for instance, there are three ways you look at air: um, a legal air. Sunnis and Shias are together in this. That legal air was Ali. He was a son-in-law. He buried the Prophet. He he was taking care of everything because he was the closest relative. Spiritual air. Shias and Sunnis have a common view that the spiritual air or the spiritual legacy of the Prophet came from from Ali. There's a majority of Sunnis who believe that. Sufis, of course, are are leading that path. The dispute is about the political, being political heir. There, Shias say he sh he was. Sunnis say Sunnis also say he was political uh, was prophet's heir, but they say he came number four rather than number one. So, two out of three categories, Ali is is heir. And then what argument I'm making is this is a way out also of the Shia Sunni crisis, so to say, that if both the groups believe that Ali was the spiritual heir. By spiritual air, I mean the, his reflections, teachings, representations are the one uh, which which give us an insight into the real essence of Islam. If Shias and Sunnis agree to that, then that's a great way to come together, keep the political difference aside for a second. Where the reality is, Ali was not the political successor because, or he was, he became political successor at number four. So that's a reality. The Shias um, need to also uh, really uh, be clear about it. The Sunnis are right. The first three caliphs were one, two, three. So I thought by bringing Ali as, I'm not saying Ali, the, the prophet's political heir. I'm not saying the spiritual heir, but I'm keeping it open, bringing the Shias and Sunnis together on one platform that he was the prophet's spiritual heir. That's mm -hmm. in that way, they will look more into his teachings which bring people together, which are talking about tolerance, which are talking about selflessness, all the good things that we talk about. So that, that was the angle that I took. Did you find it hard to be objective? Because reading um, the, the, the book, you know, you paint the image of quite an exalted figure. Uh, he seems to have no faults. Is that so? Um, did you did you struggle to 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 be objective? What what do you how would you judge what you have put down uh, on the page in terms of how you're presenting uh, Ali? Again, a very important point. He was a human being, um, and he uh, like all human beings, he went through all the struggles, especially those twenty five years when the other three caliphs, who were also very important uh, Muslim leaders and close companions of the Prophet. <laughs> That's the time that Ali was at times he was sidelined, at times he was isolated, at other times he was very active to uh, play a role. And he saw all the divisiveness and all the challenges. And, and I think he, himself he said, in his most, one of his most famous quotes is that I uh, learned about life through my changes in my own um, ideas and opinions and by, by uh, my, my ambitions not coming uh, to reality. So of course he had those, and I remember my conversation with my editor early on, um, and she had said, we understand somebody who's writing a biography is really fond of that person in most cases. Um, so, so, and I wanted it to be a short, crisp work. In many areas, I have challenged the accepted notions, both among the Shia and the Sunni, uh, which, which explain uh, some of the challenges and some of the things that he had gone through. Um, so, and but because, because I had to bring those positive facts into light, which allow the Shia and Sunni to come together 
I had limited space to operate. And then I had to emphasize that his role as the, the patron saint of Islam, which means he was a Sufi master. Um, that's how there was little space to even cover all his best things uh, or all his attributes. But it's not to say that he didn't struggle or they were not um, issues that he himself challenged his own position and at times changed his policy, which was a reflection of how um, his own worldview or his own approach changed over the period of time. What did you discover or did you discover anything while you were doing your research that you did not know or that surprised you? Where did you go for the literature, um, the sources to get, um, you know, this balanced or to try to get this uh, balanced uh, reading of this person? You know, Sunni literature or Shia literature or a combination of both. Did you find a lot about Ali in Sunni literature? Excellent question. In fact, um, I think uh, 70 to 80 percent of my sources are all Sunni sources. And probably I was uh, uh, thinking early on because of the title and uh, also my name, uh, which is in the Muslim tradition, people would guess uh, quickly, although it's uh, Hassan and Hussein uh, Abbas are all. Uh, names that are celebrated in Muslim history, a typical Hassan Abbas name is more likelihood that a person is Shia. So I was conscious of this um, at times. And I made a claim early on in the book that I will not mention any major fact which is not substantiated by both Sunni and Shia. And I think that's why it took me five or six years. I had to go through every source, even on most accepted facts I had to and statements um, like for instance uh, the, the prophet had said uh, Ali is to me what Aaron was to Moses um, there were so many references I found it in every Sunni book and I mentioned because I knew people would immediately say what is the reference and so far I have given like uh, book talks to about eight or nine major Islamic centers in US and elsewhere in the last about 20 days and um, no one challenged that and to, to my pleasant delight because that was all the hard work that had gone into it. The new discovery was um, ranging from, in fact, I realized that Sunnis and Shias have so much commonality when it comes to Ali, that it amazed me. And it kind of was painful. Neither Shias are reading Sunni books, it appears to me, nor Sunnis are reading Shia books. And that was not the case historically. This is the new world, the post. Yes, if I may interject, uh, this was not the case probably even, you know, not that long ago. We're not talking hundreds of years ago. We're talking just a, a couple of decades, maybe. I agree. Um, I agree entirely. In, actually, the best book on Ali, which is when I went to Najaf, the shrine of Ali Nabi Talib, the book that the shrine presented me, and uh, it might be of interesting fact for you, it was, it was by a Lebanese Christian, uh, George Jordak, uh, his book, which is right next to me, uh, the, Voice, uh, the Voice of Human Justice. Um, so those, those books were easily accessible, but I, one other thing that I learned was, and this was by chance when I went to uh, uh, Turkmenistan, and this was an official trip, and I mentioned to them that I'm writing a book on pilgrimage, which is my larger project with New America, and uh, they said there's a small town by the name of Hazrat Ali. So I went to that town and I found three small, beautiful mosques. And when I interviewed people there, because a lot of work of this book was oral history, the people said, we believe that Ali came here and lived here for over a decade. Now, I, there was no mention of that in any book anywhere. Uh, in fact, I went to religious scholars afterwards and said, I've interviewed people. They have uh, actually a grave of Ali's uh, horse as well. And there's a place where Ali used to meditate and people remember him. People go and do a pilgrimage of that place in Turkmenistan. And the Shia scholars also said to me, well, this is not in our books. I said, well, if, if maybe... It's not that everything is in your books. So many such stories. Um, I added those. Those were new. It, it amazed me how the Bakhtashis in Albania, uh, those uh, believers of Rumi or Sufis in, in Konya or, or elsewhere, in, in actually you, United States, when I was looking for these, I found a couple of groups uh, with beautiful mosques, Sufi tradition. And by the way, Sufis are not a separate sect. Sufis mostly are either Shia or Sunni. The kind of reverence and love for Ali in poetry, in music, in writing amazed me and it was beyond those labels. 
And I thought that needs to be brought out. And uh, so that, that, that's what was new in a sense. You, you mentioned the word, you just mentioned the word labels. And it, it definitely feels to me also growing up in, in Lebanon and traveling to countries like Pakistan and then writing my own book about how Saudi Arabia and Iran used sectarian identities and weaponized them since 1979 in their geopolitical battle, that they're very much labels, um, their political tools. I mean, obviously their identities, Sunni and Shias have those identities within them, but they are, they're, they're labels and they're, to, they're being used as geopolitical tools um, today. How, how do you see it? I agree almost entirely. And, and uh, not that you're interviewing me and that's why I'm saying, I mean, your book has uh, uh, brought this fact out in a, in a very, not only accessible fashion, but in a very fair manner. And I highly encourage people to read uh, book also, your book also for the reason being that it provides that um, uh, whole worldview and that whole reality. My work focus was to go deeper and I found the same trend historically, Baghdad, for example. Baghdad was where um, all the major Sunni and Shia jurists, like we use the word Shia and Sunni, but in fact, within the Sunni, there are four schools of jurisprudence, Hanbali, Shafi'i, Maliki, and Hanbali, um, uh, and among the Shia is Jafari school. The leaders of all these would work together, teach together. In fact, uh, three of the four Sunni grand, grand jurists were students of Jafar Sadiq, uh, the, the Shia sixth Imam, who's who was grand great grandson of Ali, as well as great grandson of Abu Bakr, the first caliph. So he brought together and his teachings led to a lot of uh, jurisprudence and schools of thought. So historically, people were very proud of their differences. Uh, uh, people were very proud of their identities, I should say, but these were not identities that were clashing with each other. Right. She is, as a political group were oppressed. They went through challenging times because they were a minority almost throughout the history. However, as you've rightly said, this new, and you have used an excellent word, the way these identities have been weaponized are very current in terms of geopolitics. This is oil revenues. This is um, Wahhabism. This is extremists among the Shia who, who for their own expansionist reasons um, and their own uh, attempt to control the narratives. This is this I used to call it um, a political economy of religious extremism. All the religious madrasas, and you go to Pakistan, you go to Indonesia, these are associated with certain schools of thought. They get money from for, for those schools, and people uh, are their whole economies are linked to those sects, so they can't come out of it. It is it is a political game that has been treacherous. This has um, done more damage to the spirit of religion than anything else. And more damage, of course, also to, to the spirit and the personality and, and, and the, 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 the image that people can have of Ali ibn Abi Talib if they're Sunni or, um, or, uh, or you know, if you're Shia, how you look at, uh, how you look at your uh, Sunni co-religionaries. And you write in your book, if Muslims found it within themselves to focus on their common appreciation of Ali, uh, the Muslim world could be changed forever. Explain this a little bit more. We talked about it a little bit already in terms of the commonality and how both revere um, Ali ibn Abi Talib as at least the spiritual uh, heir of, of the prophet. Um, but how could this, this common ground, this common appreciation help bridge some of the current uh, divides? How could it change um, the, the Muslim world? And what should policymakers in Washington take away from this conversation since you're, since you're sitting in Washington? Thank you so much. I mean, one way in which that can happen is that once those, those biases will go away, then people will open up more to his teachings. And for instance, um, I would argue that um, some of his works on justice, um, it, it is amazing how detailed are his works. His book is called Nehjul Balaha, uh, 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 which explains um, details of what a jurist would be, which explains in detail how the minorities um, in a Muslim society would be uh, dealt with. In terms of taxation, financial issues, it was amazing. In fact, I tested it in my class a couple of times. I mentioned some of his quotes and said to my students, 
who do you think I'm quoting? And they said, uh, seems like Thomas Jefferson. Um, somebody else would say another thing. And people have what they have forgotten within the Muslim tradition that because of their, uh, the sectarianism, they lost touch with the teachings and spirituality of Ali. And that's why I argue that they, as soon as they'll come to it, uh, to, to, to be reacquainted, um, they, they will be amazed. One more fact was the two people, uh, what Ali had faced uh, was, one was a group called Kharajites. This was the first terrorist group in Islam. All modern- And just to explain, Hassan, Kharajites comes from the Arabic of Kharaja, which means to exit. Exit, thank you so much. Uh, uh, absolutely. And these were those who had challenged Ali. Uh, they were very rigid. Uh, they were doing takfir, what we call takfir means declaring the other as non-Muslim for, 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 to simplify. This was a group which believed in violence. Um, and Ali had fought them very strongly and had mentioned at that time that this seed is unfortunately going to uh, grow. Um, and the other thing was, there was another Muslim important figure, some, some revere him, where him, um, uh, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, who became uh, the caliph or leader after Ali, who reflected all that was authoritarian, all that was greed for power, all that was corruption. Uh, he was the, the founder of the Umayyads. This is now I'm getting into an area which is a bit sensitive, but the way Ali challenged him through a discourse, through letters, uh, through, through a conversation, that was in itself a message um, that, okay, let's talk on these issues. What is all this means for policymakers today um, in the United States are two or three things that come to my mind. One, um, that this offers other than a way to understand the historical context of Islam and also to see the spirituality and the, and the beauty of religious experience, it allows for a conversation. It allows an opening for interfaith dialogue. Um, when uh, Pope Francis went to Iraq recently and the way he walked up to Ayatollah Sistani, the way they were holding hands, um, I think that was a very powerful moment. I really hope that that will be replicated among Christians and Muslims, among Shias and Sunnis, and it's absolutely possible. I am very convinced. Um, I remember, again, a one-minute anecdote, I promise. I know we have to go to q and I was in a, a synagogue in New York uh, some years ago. They invited me to talk about um, Muslim-Jewish relations. And before that, they said, we have a prayer. Uh, and I, I sat on the side when the prayer happened and I started listening to the, the English translation for after the Hebrew one. And I seriously thought that maybe they have been very kind to me. They have picked a Muslim prayer just to, because I'm going to speak. And later on, I asked, I said, so I know this prayer. They said, so do you read Hebrew? Do you need Torah? I said, no. They said, it's a prayer from Torah. And I said to them, you know, I bet this is a prayer that at least 70 to 80% of the prayer that I do in Dwai Komel, actually that's Ali's prayer, uh, Ali. And they said, no, this is, and I was really stunned how much little Muslims know about Jewish prayers and maybe little the Jews know about Muslim prayers. So there is so much around us, these commonality among different faiths. And in this world of polarization, we have our own religious figures. It's not about, I'm not trying to um, kind of proselytize or that that's not the purpose. The point is, stay who you are, but have some empathy, have some compassion, try to understand the other. Don't look everyone else, in this case, for the policymakers, the Muslims, as the other. Um, that, that's also a message for the policy. Yeah, a very, a very important message uh, for, for everyone everywhere uh, these days in this age of, of polarization. And, and I love that you see um, Ali as this sort of hero that could uh, inspire uh, a more empathetic uh, approach to um, interfaith uh, relations. Uh, we're going to go to Q&A in a moment, but I have um, one last uh, question for you, Hassan. Um, this is a very important book. I know you've had uh, quite a lot of events already. You've had, I think you told me, you've had um, uh, praise from both Sunnis and Shias, but also hate mail from Sunnis and Shias. Um, and I'm just wondering about translations. If you're hoping and planning, if you already know whether the book would be translated into Arabic, into Urdu and other, you know, other languages and what your hopes are for translations. I really hope it will be translated into Spanish, into Arabic. Um, initially, I thought that 
the Arabs know it, uh, all this, uh, but apparently not really because of all the conflict and all the, uh, uh, all the differences. But the first offer for its translation came uh, from Iraq, uh, from a friend. Um, and the first event was also in Iraq, uh, which, which really pleasantly surprised me. But, but also there are challenges. For example, um, from one country, uh, I'll name it, uh, I love Pakistan. Of course, I am originally from Pakistan. I'm a proud American of Pakistani heritage. But I was told that uh, publishers are not, have decided not to import the book because they think the title is blasphemous. And I said, what? What is the blasphemy on the title? They said, there's a picture of Ali I wish I could have shown you. you I'm sure the book yeah. is on, on, on the website. It's on the screen, yeah. So it's not showing the face features. Um, in Iraq, in Iran, everywhere you go, in Lebanon, among the, the Shia especially, the, the features are always shown. Yeah. And um, so this is, they said, there's, then they read it, they said the book is good, the, the agents, and they said, but the, uh, we cannot have it in bookstores because it, it will lead to um, a challenge that uh, we are uh, not being sensitive to Muslim sensibility. Mm -hmm. So in certain cases, I'm using Pakistan's case just to explain um, some of the bigotry, biases, ignorance, arrogance at times has come in the way. So I really hope I'll be able to overcome. And they said, we, you are welcome, republish it without the cover and we can take it. Mm. So that's the cover it's going to stay. People will buy it from Amazon or elsewhere. If I could, I'll buy books and distribute freely in Pakistan. But that, that, those are the kind of challenges also. Yeah. Um, well, there is one of the, uh, someone in the audience who's actually the consul, the honorary consul general of Pakistan in Boston. Uh, and he sent a little message saying, good work, Hassan. I learned quite a bit. So, um, you know, hopefully your book will make it into Pakistan. I think it's an important book. We have one question uh, from Zuleika Hussein, who asks you something a bit similar to what I asked uh, earlier in the conversation. What was an instance you found from history uh, that if Sunnis or Shahs knew of today, they would be shocked that their current narratives of each other are wrong. So what did you find that is, is, is different than what um, Sunnis and Shahs believe of their own uh, narrative? I think if uh, I'll, I'll go uh, to talk about both the Shia and Sunnis, I think if Shias would really know how tolerant was Ali, during the times of the first three caliphs, they would rethink uh, because Ali never fought. Uh, Ali was trusted so much by second caliph Umar, for example, um, who had expanded the frontiers of Islam. So there were some controversies as well, uh, which, which, which are linked to the Islam's expansionism. However, uh, Caliph Umar knew very well Ali's belief and Ali's claim that it was his right to be a caliph. But whenever uh, Umar would go anywhere, across uh, for his campaigns, he would, a couple of times at least, he left Ali in charge of the place because he knew Ali can be anything, but Ali is not going to uh, stab him in the back, that Ali is not the one who will, can, can't be trusted. So the Sunnis also, when they would know that, for instance, there's one famous statement called Hadith. This is the most important event. In the Sunni, the Muslims at times would challenge it. And I found it that it, was, it has the highest number of references from Sunni sources. 110 companions of the Prophet quoted it. And the statement was, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had said, uh, whosoever thinks that I am his master should think of Ali as the master. Shias say this was enough to see him as the, the heir to the Prophet. The Sunnis also believe in it in, in, in a very strong fashion. If more Sunnis know how strong is this uh, narration? How strong is the evidence from Sunni books? I think Sunnis would be shocked. If Sunnis read some of their own books, they'll be shocked to know how central Ali was. And for the Shias, um, at times, uh, because of their love for Ali, they have built walls around them. Right. They try to dominate and own Ali. So no one should, be, should try to own Ali. Uh, and that has been, been one of the issues. There's one great question from Alan Luxemburg who asks, are there any major differences between the Prophet Muhammad and Ali in terms of their outlook on life and their day-to-day -day lives? No, um, I think uh, this was Ali, if anything, uh, was a true uh, reflection of the Prophet. And why I argue that? Because there were in many traditions within the Shia, an Ismaili tradition, 
uh, among the Ismaili Shias, a very important uh, part of the, the Shia tradition. Many others as well, Zaydis um, uh, in Yemen, elsewhere, some of the Sufi groups as well, some of the Alevites um, in Syria and Lebanon in those parts of the world, who gave much more to Ali than, than the references would indicate in some cases, which raised the Sunni challenge by saying that Shias or some of those Sufi groups are building Ali as parallel to the Prophet, which becomes then extremely problematic and divisive. So, um, and I ignored all those references, which would give, say things about Ali, which are not substantiated by historical facts. Maybe in a spiritual sense, uh, he, people have not realized fully what Ali was, but, and Ali himself had said, his actually most famous quote was, he said, two kind of people will be destroyed uh, as it relates to him. Those who exaggerate his status and those who underestimate him. So, so that, that's how I would frame it. We have a question from Steve France, a very important one, picking up on what you just said a little bit. Um, how important is it to weigh the nature of Ali's death and the way in which the traditions have handled that shocking death? Because of course he was assassinated. He was assassinated by a Kharijite. Uh, we just uh, talked about them, you know, the sort of the, 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 the ancient or the, the you know, the, the precursors to, to extremism or that seed that was there already um, at the beginning. So how important is it to look at how Ali died uh, and how the tradition reflects that today? Thank you for the question. Extremely important. In fact, this reminds me uh, of the larger tragedy, not only that he was assassinated in, in a mosque in, in uh, morning prayers when he, he was uh, in prostration, also that his grave had to be kept a secret for 125 years. And I say this to most of my Sunni friends and brothers and sisters. Please think about it. Ali was the fourth caliph. Forget he was the first Imam of the Shias. He was so close to the Prophet. He was part of the family of the Prophet. Um, there are more statements in Sunni sources about Ali than all together about the first three caliphs, who also always believed Ali to be superior to them in many cases, spiritual uh, terms especially. Why Ali's grave had to be kept in Najaf secret for over 100 years? Because the, the fear was that his enemies would come and take out his body in disgrace. That is a very strong thing. And this is a consensus among the Shia and Sunni, and that's what happened. So the, the challengers, the, the, the counter revolution to Islam had happened at that time. And Muslims, some Muslims, in an effort to bring everyone together in, tries, in trying to attempt or cover up what the Umayyads had done, what the Abbasids had done, those were not divinely oriented people. Those were pure politicians, uh, some of whom who were very corrupt, uh, very extremist. They expand, the way they expanded uh, the frontiers of Islam was through violence. I mean, Muslims have to come to, to accept some of those realities among, and those were the ones for whom Ali's message of tolerance, Ali's message of spirituality was something that they wanted to stay away from because they were worldly players who wanted empire building. Those empire builders, uh, for them, Islam's message and especially Ali's message of spirituality and tolerance and selflessness was a challenge. So, this, so that's why I mean, it, it, the death of Ali, in fact, was uh, the point from where the counter revolution to Islam uh, became very, very strong. And that's often in all politics and in all um, Shia Sunni polemics, this point is missed. Sorry, I can't hear you. We have a question from Pinky uh, Virani who picks up on some of what we've uh, already been discussing that Sunnis, the way she, I'm, I'm phrasing, I'm, I'm, I'm reading her question the way she phrased it. Sunnis don't believe in Hazrat Ali because of several reasons. So, you know, you've addressed some of it already. Um, you know, how do you think you can convince Sunnis of his importance? Um, you've mentioned uh, some ways already about the common ground, about how he is revered. But how difficult is it, do you think, to reach a Sunni audience with this message? In fact, one of my findings from this book is that Sunnis believe in Ali almost as much as Shias do. I, I'm 
very honestly are frank to this. I, I encourage um, the, the questionnaire to read the book um, and also to look at the page, the sources. Um, she feels should feel free to send me an email and I'll scan it or send the, the, the sources to her. It is all embedded in the Sunni sources. It is the modern, what Sunnis need to understand, also Shias in some way, that the degeneration of religious political thought has become a big issue. Yeah. The way the modern madrasas and religious seminaries have built up, they are in, in, unfortunately more in the Sunni side, which have become very politicized, which have become very sectarian, and not all Sunnis. I think a majority of Sunnis, for instance, those who believe in the Sufi tradition, those in South Asia who believe in the in the, in the Barelvi tradition. Barelvi was a person, uh, this is a tradition from India, a way which are more Sufi oriented. You will be amazed the commonality of view between the Barelvi Sunni Muslims and the Shias and, and the Sufis. So we need to look, read the own, their own sources. I had figured out in this process, neither Shias read their own historical references nor Sunnis. So Sunnis will be amazed when they'll read history and when they will try to step, step a little bit out of uh, what, what is the comfort zone. Mm -hmm. but everyone wants to stay in the very, very comfortable zone and being politically correct. But let, let me push you a little bit more on this question. Um, uh, academically, let's say, or theologically, yes, it might be right. It might be correct that you know, Sun Sunnis believe and revere uh, Ali as much as Shias, but today, in today's world, how can you put this message across in a way that, as you very ambitiously write in your own book, um, could change the Muslim world? I think, and it is by by interacting more with among more interaction among the Shia and the Sunni. And I say with some pain, and I'm guessing uh, from Boston, it is must be Barry Hoffman, the Pakistan's honorary consul general. Uh, uh, a person I love and I admire and my very dear friend, he has been Pakistan's honorary consul general, I think for the last 30 or 40 years, uh, 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 one of my other heroes in this life, uh, uh, an amazing person, a person who brought, uh, who uh, with his Jewish faith, uh, explained it to so many Pakistanis that a, a person of Jewish faith can be such a great friend of Muslims. I, I think in his own work, there's a, there's, there's a big message. Uh, and in, in uh, while admiring him, I forgot part of the question, but uh, for the Shias and Sunnis, I think they have to start visiting. I was thinking of Boston, and I know some of my friends from Boston are there as well. Because of my broader family, which had more Shias as well as Sunnis, I was amazed that in Boston, as well as in New York, the Shia mosques and the Sunni mosques operate in very different zones. Muslims don't, and this challenges the, the sweeping, some of the narrations, not because they are always against each other, just because of the way uh, some of the so social things have developed. They don't go to each other's religious gatherings. Socially, yes, they meet often and they, there's no, I mean, less biases, especially in America. And, and that's why the book in, in US is important from my point of view, because there's more openness. We have, um, I'm not expecting uh, that anyone can come and attack me or hopefully not. Uh, I'm thinking of comparing it with uh, other countries where, where such extremists are strong. So Shias and Sunnis have to talk to each other more. Uh, there has to be more uh, scholarship that has to take place. Um, and, and these are the two ways that they will be amazed at the openness and also by going to the roots of their own religious experience. Mm -hmm. That that has, it has become too politicized. Uh, it has become too Iran versus Saudi Arabia in, in a discourse. Um, it has to come out of that and go to what the prophet had taught. Um, that, that's, I think, it's a, it's a broad statement I'm making, but I am very confident that any Shia and Sunni who will start reading their own materials will be amazed at the range of commonalities that exist. And there has to be an openness. That's why I have more hope from young Muslims who are not as uh, stuck with their identities as their parents are. Absolutely. I, I, I fully agree with you. I mean, today, surveys show that in, in the uh, Arab and Muslim world, uh, young, the young generation feels that religion has played too big a role for too long and they'd like to uh, move on from that. Uh, we have time for two last quick questions. Uh, one from Sadiq Awainati, he says, you explained very well Ali's spiritualism. Uh, can you tell us briefly about his dealing with administration? 
as being um, the caliph and the head of state, so to speak. Absolutely, this reminds I hope I can quickly find uh, one statement from Ali when he became um, the caliph. And his first statement was, he uh, said, uh, I know the, the time is running away, um, so I'll try to remember and paraphrase it. What Ali had said as soon as he became caliph, he said, I have some rights on you which are equal to what rights you have over me. Um, he decided not to move into a palace. There was a palace. Um, so he was a person who was down to earth, who argued that um, the, on the very first day, and that's where some of the Shia Sunni differences come as well. He said, I will take away all privileges from the elites. The elites who had built palaces because Islam had expanded, a lot of money had come into the time of the third caliph and the second caliph. And the new elite was built up. Ali challenged them. That's why he faced such severe backlash and, and challenge. So Ali's system of government was egalitarian, was based on justice. He went into so many details on why equality um, uh, and rights of minorities are extremely, extremely important. That's what his, uh, was defined by his, uh, by, by, by his worldview, by his politics. So that, that's I would uh, emphasize. And that's why the challenge came. Otherwise, it was not sectarian per se that people uh, had ch challenged him because of his spirituality or something he was saying in terms of Islam. His policies about administrative policies of equality and taking away privileges uh, was something which got him into a difficult point. And that many Muslims don't want to go that route. And they, because they say, oh, it is, he had challenged the elites who were closer to the first three caliphs. Oh, that is sectarianism. Well, that is not sectarianism, that is history. And we need to be open to history. So to, to, to wrap the conversation, uh, Hassan, we have a question from Jay Zaidi, uh, who asks, um, you know, uh, briefly, uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, what are the key takeaways you think that people should take from, from this book as Muslims or as, as non-Muslims? If you want to give us, you know, one or two key takeaways. I think I've talked about many of those. The key takeaways are, um, number one, to focus first and foremost on the spirituality. And, and, and by spirituality, I mean that looking at everyone from the same lens through, through, um, through equality and uh, not have any biases when, and not to judge people. This, whether it's somebody within the Muslim tradition or outside, and that's the equally, uh, I'm making the point for my Christian and Jewish friends and Hindu and Buddhist friends. That this, um, we, we judge the others by, by, by our own norms. I think my final conclusion is, it was amazing for me how universal was Ali's personality, how his, his message is relevant to the modern day world. That's why I argue Ali's legacy is so central for the future of Islam and Islam's relationship with the West. I think my Western audience will be amazed at how much they will find common of what um, Moses had said, to what Jesus had said, to what Prophet Muhammad had said, uh, to what Ali followed. That universality, that message of spirituality, which has universal values embedded in it, I think that that's the key message. And that's a wonderful uh, way to end this really fascinating uh, conversation with this key takeaway about uh, the universality of, of values and, um, you know, how we can build common ground, not only between Sunnis and Shias, but between the different uh, faiths. Uh, Hassan Abbas, thank you so much for writing this book, for asking me to be in conversation with you to launch it at New America Foundation. Thank you to New America Foundation for hosting, uh, for hosting us, and thank you to all of you in the audience for tuning in. Thank you very much. That's it for us. Signing off from Beirut and from DC.